I, I wasn't really prepared for it so far because I had turned on my iPad and I was trying to put the black six on the red seven. And, and so some of you will get that on the way home. Aren't you glad to be in church today? I am so glad to be here. I want to thank this awesome congregation for allowing 15 churches from Utah to South uh, New Mexico into Colorado. They met here four times over the last year. And we had approximately 200, 225 people in this room yesterday. And they were working on how to help strengthen the church, how to find God's will for their church. And this church has been the catalyst point to make that happen. And without you guys opening up this, the, your facilities for us over the past year, this wouldn't have happened. So on behalf of all the churches that were represented and the phenomenal things we saw yesterday, thank you so much for opening up your church. And Pastor Paul and Pastor Mary, thank you so much for your open doors and your open heart. I, from the first time I met your pastor, I knew God had something rich for him and her. Uh, I, I can still uh, just remember that first connection point, the first time we walked in here, and it was just like, click, that young man's got something special, Rick. He, he's got a special anointing on his life. He has a special gift of leadership in his life, and if he'll allow you, just pour into it. You know, the key to being a mentor or letting someone speak into your life is, First of all, you've got to believe that they have your best interest at heart. If someone doesn't have your best interest at heart, you're really not going to listen. Number two, you've got to understand that when someone's going to speak into your life, they're going to challenge a process in you. Whether it is your home life, your personal life, your church life, your business life, they're going to challenge a process. And you've got to just push through that and say, you know what, I like when you come, but you tick me off every time. Because that is growth. That is the way you grow. Uh, when Pastor was talking about uh, the terrible twos and the terrible teens, I can still remember, and I shared this, I was here for Father's Day weekend, and I can remember my son was, I have, my children are 15 months apart. I have a son who's very submissive, very quiet. He would never get in trouble, never get in trouble. I have a daughter who believes trouble is her middle name. Does any, do you have a child like that that pushes everything? That when, if you tell her you got to go to bed at 8 o'clock, she's got 15 reasons why 8 o'clock's not late enough. And you end up arguing with her till 8.30 and you realize when she goes to bed at 8.30, she actually won. And she's only three years old when this is happening. That's my daughter. My son, if I said, son, it's time to go to bed, he just turns around and goes. You get to watch TV for 20 minutes. At 17 minutes, he's going, how many more minutes do I have? I mean, that was just my son. So when my son got his driver's license, I thought, this is going to be a blast. My son's going to be good. He's going to be the, the positive image for my daughter. He's going to show her how to do it. He got his license on a Tuesday, and on Friday, he totaled my car. <clears throat> just totaled it. My convertible. He didn't... He didn't Total the van. He, took, he totaled the convertible. I was mad about that. And uh, my son, some people total a car when they hit a tree. Some people total a car when they hit a car. Some people total a car when they lose control of the car. I don't know many people who total a car because they hit a train. But my son hit a train. And I asked him, I said, son, did you not see the train. It's a pretty big thing out there, son, and it's going to keep on coming. I mean, and he goes, Dad, I didn't see the train. <laughs> what do you mean you didn't see the train? He goes, Dad, I was messing with the radio. I never saw the train. And I, when I said that, my daughter just like, ha, 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 if the good boy can total a car, oh, you're in trouble, Dad. You're in trouble. If you're a guest here today, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I just regret you're not here to hear Pastor Paul preach, so please make plans to be back here next Sunday. If you're online and you're watching with us, hi, honey. I think my wife is watching. Uh, I, I appreciate you online watching because 
we believe that God has a special place for you too, and we're just so glad that you've given us your time on this Sunday morning to watch us via the internet. And so this morning, uh, I was asked last night uh, about our scripture. So if I tell you, let's go to John chapter 2. Uh, and, and let's look at something, and I love this little thing right here. This is just sweet. John chapter 2, and if, it's, if you have it in the NIV, let's go with the NIV. If not, we'll preach it out of anywhere. And if you have your Bibles, go with me to John chapter 2. Turn your Bibles on, open them up, and let's look at a scripture. And John chapter 2 is probably the catalyst point for the New Testament church. In fact, it is the catalyst point. This story has so much more meaning than what we usually see, and it has so much background, rich background, that it begins the pathway of where we're going to end up as a church. And because of this, Jesus is going to do some phenomenal things through this, and there's, there's backstories in every scripture, and you have to kind of study them out to find them. And so we have to realize there's been a period of time where God has quit talking to the prophets. He's not ministering. He's not giving words to the Old Testament prophets. The Israel has now just got into a pattern of wait, wait, wait. And the problem with patterns is from if you wait six months, you'll wait one way. If you wait a year, you wait another way. If you wait five years, you wait another way. If you wait ten years, you'll wait another way. But when you start waiting 400 years, you start waiting another way. And the original intent of the weight begins to change because people start putting their own interpretation, their own spin on it. So as we come to this place where Israel has not had a word from the Lord, there's been these years of silence. Israel is desperately wanting to have Messiah. They're looking for Messiah. They want Messiah. They, they, they're, they're wanting for the truth to be fulfilled. And in the fullness of time, God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit picked a chosen time to speak to Mary and say, Mary, you're engaged to Joseph. You're going through the patterns of engagement in the Jewish culture. And because of that... We are going to, we're, I am going to impregnate you with my son. And you're going to birth him. And he's going to be the son of God and the son of man. And he's going to die for the sins of the world. Now Mary realizes she's, between a, she's in a very difficult place. Elizabeth, her cousin, is going to be birthing John the Baptist. And Mary is not married, although Elizabeth is. Mary is going to have to deal with the people misunderstanding what's happening. People are going to judge her and think that she has been frolicking in, in, the, in sex. When Mary is being a righteous person living according to the law, and yet at the same time she's going to take a lot of punishment. A lot of punishment. They, when the baby is born, Jesus is born. He's not born in a house. He is not born in a in a a hostel, which is like a hospital or a place of rest. What we call the traveler's rest in the New Testament time. He's not born in a business where friends are helping him. He ends up being born in a manger because there was no room. In the end, there was no room. I mean, the Motel 6 didn't even have the light on. And, um, and so Mary ends up in a manger with cows and, and, uh, and, and all kinds of animals, horses and lambs. And, and she's in this manger, and she's going to have this child, and she's going to birth this child. Israel doesn't want... Messiah to come out of a child. They want Messiah to be an instant king. He's going to go through his 12 years of growth in the temple. He is going to then go through his 18 years of silence into adulthood. And he's going to eventually become 30 years old. And at that time, 
the Holy, the Holy Spirit enables him to start the public ministry. So just think, if, if you had a dream or a vision for what God wanted you to do, and he said, I'm going to make you hold it for 30 years, and then you're only going to get to produce it for three, and you're going to have to entrust that people can understand what you do in those three years, and if they can't, you're in trouble. We as pastors would go, whoa, that's not a good, that's not a good picture. And that's where we get. We have come up on a, it's a Saturday in John chapter 2. And let's begin to read and we'll just stop. We'll just read until I tell you to stop. Let's start. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana. Everybody say Cana. In Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Now let's stop right there. Jewish women were married on three days of the week. They were, if you were a virgin, you were married on a Wednesday. If you were a widow, you were married on a Thursday. And if you had permission from the priest and the mayor of the city you lived in, you could be married on a Sabbath wedding. And this is a Sabbath day wedding. The first miracle he does is going to be on the Sabbath. They're going to mess everything up. And so on this Sabbath day wedding, the groom's parents and the bride's parents go to the priest and they tell the priest, which would be Pastor Paul, we would like our daughter to be married on a Saturday. And Pastor Paul would ask them a series of questions. If they, they could fulfill the requirements that the church had for them, the, the temple had for them, then the priest would release them to go to the mayor. And the mayor would then schedule a time on a Saturday that was available in the community for the, for the wedding. Because on a Sabbath day wedding, some things were very interesting. Number one, there was no invitation sent on a Sabbath day wedding. Everyone who lived in the city was invited to a Sabbath day wedding. So in, if you wanted to get married on a Saturday here, everyone in Grand Junction would be able to come to the wedding. Number two... The groom and the bride's parents are responsible for all the food and drink at the reception for the city. And number three, the reception goes from Saturday night until the following Friday night to the beginning of the next Sabbath. Which means you have to feed everyone in Grand Junction for one week. Right about now, I'm looking at my daughter, and I'm saying, Honey, Wednesday sounds real good to me. <laughs> right? So they go through all this, and they get permission. Now, on a Sabbath day wedding, there were some restrictions. Number one, only people in the city were allowed to attend the Sabbath day wedding. There was only two exceptions. Number one, your family, you're part of the family, or number two, you're part of the serving group that's going to serve the community or the city for the period of a week. And from the indications of scriptures, let's keep reading. Verse 3. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Stop there. From this indication, it looks like Mary is part of the serving party. And because she received a special exemption to come... They gave an exemption for Mary to bring her family. The indicating from theologians is that Joseph has probably passed away by now. And because she was a widow, the law of widowness meant that Mary, whenever she went somewhere, her family had to go with her. And that is why Jesus is at the wedding. And since Jesus is at the wedding, Jesus brings his posse with him. So Jesus, it's Mary... It's Jesus, James, Jesus' half-brother. The whole group's with them. And then Jesus' posse. And they're at the wedding. And somewhere on the first day or two, Mary goes to them and says, Son, let's go to the next one. She goes to them and says, Son, they have no more wine. And he says to her, Woman, why do you involve me? My hour's yet not come. Now stay right there. This is the first thing I know about Jesus. He's not Hispanic. 
I know that. He has no Hispanic blood in him. Because if I was to turn, my mother's from Madrid, Spain. If I turned to that little Spaniard and I said, woman, I'd wake up three days later. Uh, but that would be it. I never would have got, I would have, I would have never got why out. I would have said, woman, pow, with a skillet upside my head. That would have been the end of it. I never would have said my hour has. I have, well, it hasn't. How about you? Go home and look at your mom and go, now kids, you don't do this. Don't, don't go home and look at your mom and say, when she says clean the room, go, woman, my hour's yet not come to clean my room. Watch what happens to you. Just watch. Watch. And don't blame me. I'm on a plane flying out of here in three hours. And he goes, woman, why do you want to involve me? My hour's yet not come. What he was saying is that Father God has not instructed me to move forward yet. Don't press my public place. Now, this is what I love is the next verse. Let's look at the next verse. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I love this. Have, have you ever said something to your mother and she just gives you the look? All, all the little kids are going, oh, yeah. You know, there's times where I would, my mom would say something and I would just... I would, uh, and, I would, and I would turn back and give her back a rebu- or a rebuttal, and she would just, and she'd just stare you down. And I mean, those little Spaniard eyes, and I was like, ooh, wow, I crossed that line. Mm. And if she got real mad, she, wouldn't, she would just stare at me. And then she would say, go to your room. Your father will deal with you when he gets home. Oh, that's bad. And I would sit in that room for three hours waiting for dad to come. I was convinced he could kill me 18 ways and get away with it. I can remember one time I did something really bad. So I won't testify, so you won't do it. And I realized I'm going to get the beating of my life. How many know what I'm talking about? Back when, back when, Beating a child was legal. <laughs> and I decided I was going to sneak into the kitchen. And I got a number eight cast iron skillet. And I went back to my bedroom. And I put that skillet in my pants. And I just sat on that bed with that skillet. And I, I was tilted at about 45 degrees. And I just waited till Dad got home. And here's how it works in my house. I hear you, you gave your mother problems. Not really. She just kind of she kind blew up. I mean, you know, you've seen her. <laughs> well, your mother said that you, 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 you caused trouble. Roll over and grab the bedspread. So you roll over and you had to reach over and grab the bedspread so you can't put your hand back fast. And I thought, and I had a big sweatshirt on. Because I didn't want him to see the skillet. And he reared back and hit me and it went, PANG! And I was like, ha, 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 ha. I'm not for sure what happened next. He reached down and he grabbed the skillet. And he grabbed it and when he pulled it up, I just came up with the skillet because I couldn't get my pants undone to get the skillet out. And the next thing you know, he's slinging me around and woof, into the wall I go. And when I hit that wall, he just turned on and walked away and I, I said, note to self, never use a skillet again. I love this. Woman. Why do you want to involve me? My hours not my hours yet not come. And Mary just looks at him like serious? And she just she just quits looking at him and she looks over at the servants and she said, Let me tell you something. Whatever he's about to tell you to do, you're gonna do it. Do you understand me? 
And she turns to the servant and says, well, do whatever he tells you to do. Now, this is what's interesting. I, this is the way I see this scripture playing out. Because i got this weird head. I can see when Jesus says that to his mom, and he responds to her, and she responds back. I can see Mary said, whatever he's going to tell you to do, you're going to do it. You understand? Mm-hmm. I'll be right back. And I can see Mary walk over to a corner somewhere. <clears throat> and she says, Father God, we need to talk. And I can see angels in heaven going, everybody be quiet. Shh, God's in trouble. Mary not happy. And I can hear Mary saying, sir, 31 years ago, I was minding my own business. I was just being, I was minding my own business. And you tapped me on the shoulder and said that I was going to birth your son. I'm not even married yet. I'm engaged, but I'm not married. And I didn't, I didn't argue with you. I didn't say my hour's not yet come. I said, as the Lord wills. 30 years ago, you thought it would be funny to stick me in a manger. You didn't put me in a hospital. You didn't put me in a friend's house. You didn't put me in the inn. You didn't put me anywhere. You stuck me in a manger to bear birth your, birth your son. And I didn't say, my hour's yet not come. I just said, as God wills. And I birthed my baby. I raised him. I taught him how to rake the dirt and walk the camel. I did everything for him. I've taken care of him, taken care of his brothers. I've done everything you've asked me to do. And the first time I ask him to do something for me, he tells me he doesn't think he can. I don't think so. You know, we got a saying, if mama ain't happy, this is where it begins right here. Mama's not happy. This is where the whole story, that statement comes from. And I can see, I can see the Holy Spirit lean over the Father God and go, you better do something. She's mad. And I can see Father God whisper, Son, I didn't know you were going to tick her off. You really got her mad. She's talking to me. You better do something, man. I can't handle much more of this. So look at the next verse. Now, they're in an open pavilion. Remember the the people of the city, approximately 8,000 people from Cana live there at this time. It's an open pavilion, and all in the corners and at different posts, there are big water pots. They stand about hip high. They're built like a flower bowl. They have this this wrap out, this, this little lip on the top, and they're made out of stone. And it's the community water because everyone doesn't have wells. And what they would do is they would fill the community pots up at these pavilions area, these public areas, and people would go get water from them. And so... Nearby stand six of those, of, there may be 30, 40, 50 of them, but Jesus picked six. And nearby stood six stone water pots, the kind used, uh, 20, holding 20 to 30 uh, gallons for ceremonial washing. Now, the ceremonial washing is actually the drinking of water and what you, would, what you could use to dip out, to take home and bathe. And he picked six of them, and these things are heavy. And the servants go, and they, they, they go, and they get them. And they bring them to Jesus. And then look what happens. Next verse. And Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Jesus says, I want you to fill them to the max that they can hold. Now, by ceremonial washing, they fill them to the lower part of the upper rim. That way, when they clean the water, it doesn't spill out on the side. They want to keep the outside of the stone uh, dry so it doesn't, because if you let the water drop on the outside, the heat will will make the pot even hotter because the water will begin to boil on the outside of the pot, of the stone. And Jesus says, fill them up to the brim. And the guys are going, Jesus, we're not allowed to use these six pots. But we went and got them. 
And by law, we're not supposed to fill them up to the brim, but your mama said whatever you say. And this is the reason for that. A ceremony washing pot had a, a system of purification. You would fill the water pot up on a Friday. You fill it up to the bottom of the brim. And then on Saturday, the Sabbath, you can't touch it. So all the impurities in the water will either sink to the bottom if they're heavier than water, and they float to the top if it's lighter than water. When The way God built water is that there's nothing that is buoyant in water without artificial assistance, oxygen. Because you have to have two parts hydrogen, two parts oxygen to be buoyant. That's why you have to wear an oxygen mask and a tank when you swim. So all, all the impurities that go into water, if it's heavier than the water, it sinks to the bottom. If it's lighter than water, it floats to the top. And then on Saturday, it gives them 24 hours for it to do this. And then on Sunday morning, the servants will go and they will skim the top of the water off and get all the impurities off. They go back on Sunday night and they skim them and they put a lid on it. They do this every day for a week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Morning and night. Morning and night. Then on the second Friday, they let it sit again for a Sabbath. Second Sabbath. Then on the, the uh, second Sunday... They take the lid off, they skim it, and then they hang a ladle on the outside of it so people know they can drink that water. And they would drink the water till it gets down to about a foot from the bottom where all the impurities are. At that time, they take the ladle off, they put the lid back on, and they wait till Friday. And on Friday, they take the pots and they wash the inside of the pots and the outside of the pots, and they flip them upside down, and they sit in the sun upside down for one week to dry. Then they flip the pot over, and they put the water back in. So when Jesus says, go get me six water pots, we know that the water pots were just rinsed out the night before. And they haven't been through their drying cycle for purification. And Jesus is shattering the system of the way people think you're supposed to use water. Their basic need. Then he says, fill it to the top, and they're like, we're not supposed to fill it to the top. But your mama said, so we're going to fill it to the top. Then look what happens. says, then he tells them, now draw it out and take it to the master of the banquet, and they did so. And they're saying, now wait a minute, we haven't even skimmed the impurities off the top of the water right now. We haven't even removed one, one impurity out. Now remember, this is the first miracle Jesus does. But your mama said, so they grab a ladle, they go get a ladle, they bring it and they dip it out, and they take it to the master of the banquet. So they did so. Look at the next verse. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants had drawn the water new. And he called the bridegroom aside. Next verse. And he says, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you've saved the best till now. Stay right there. The bridegroom, the master, says, listen, we always bring out the best stuff first. And then as the week goes on, you bring out the bad stuff so we don't have to spend as much money. But yet now you brought out the good stuff. And the servants knew. Servants always, when servants hear the master's voice, they always respond to the master's call. When leaders hear the pastor's voice, leaders always respond to the pastor's call. And then it happens. Verse 11. When Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs... And in the, in the King James, it says the miraculous signs through which, now stay there, he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him or put their trust in him. That is important. Because now what happens is that in the story that I've just told you, there are seven major miracles. Not one, seven. Let me tell you the seven miracles. Because the seven miracles are the seven miracles that must be instituted in the New Testament church for the New Testament church to grow. 
See, there's always a day where we go to church and we always go to church. There's, there's days of discovery, there's days of decisions, and then there's days of destiny. And on the Sundays when I pastored and it was a destiny Sunday, I was always excited because I sensed in my spirit God was going to speak something. People may not respond accordingly, but God was going to plant seed. And that seed was going to germinate, and that destiny seed was going to end up bringing harvest that I was believing for. And I knew that that germinated seed was going to go through our leadership and, and through our congregation, and it was going to change the course of the way we did church in the future. I always look forward to Destiny Sundays. Did I know what Sundays were Destiny Sundays? No. But I it usually sensed it. During that week, I would realize that what I was going to preach, or I had a guest speaker coming, that they were going to say something that was going to be a catalytic moment for our church. And I needed that Destiny Sunday. There's some Sundays where I'm preaching and people are just discovering truth. There's other Sundays where I'm preaching to people who are making decisions about truth. And then there's Sundays where we're talking about destiny and the possibility of believing in the truth. Now, these seven miracles were very interesting. And if you're careful, you won't see them. Number one, the first miracle that happens is when the, when the servants put the water into the stone jar. The first miracle is there's going to have to be a film put between the stone jar and the water. So when the water is turned into wine, the stone won't make the wine acidic or bitter. So the first miracle Jesus does is he's got to stick a film between the stone and the wine. In fact, you are made out of the same stuff the stone was made out of. Dirt. And this representation is saying, if I can make wine come out of a stone jar, your body is of clay. What can I bring out of you if you trust me? Second miracle is that Jesus has to take the dirty water and he has to turn it into pure water. The purer the water, the better the wine. So the next miracle that's going to happen is, boom, Jesus is going to turn water, dirty water, and to purified water without anyone skimming it or taking it through a process. See, the Father, when the Father does a miracle for you, he does it through time. When Jesus does a miracle for you, he does it in the moment. So if you pray by faith and it doesn't happen instantly, the Father is trying to teach you the miracle of time. If you pray and Jesus answers the does your miracle instantly, he's showing you the, the miracle of power. But if you pray by faith and you ask God for something, whether it comes instantly or in time, God is going to produce the miracle if you prayed by faith. The question is, is do you understand the difference between power and process? Don't grow weary and well-doing. If you don't faint... It'll happen. So if you believe in God for a miracle and it hasn't happened yet, the Father is in control of your miracle, and he's wanting you to be aged. So when the miracle happens, you can handle it. There are times where the, where the Son is going to produce an instantaneous miracle in your life because he wants to demonstrate his glory through your miracle so people can resonate to Jesus. See, miracles never happen to you. They happen through you. So when people always ask me for a miracle when I pastor, I said, what's the, what's the outcome of this miracle? Well, I want God to heal me so I can be with my family. Mm, wrong answer. Well, I want God to heal me so I can be used by him. Mm, wrong answer. That's all what's going to happen to you. The reason God heals you is for his glory to flow through you. The reason he heals you is that his glory can be revealed. And I'm going to tell you about that in a second. And if you're not in a place where you're understanding that whatever God's going to do through you, and if Jesus is going to bring a miracle to you, you need to understand first and foremost, it's for God to reveal his glory in the conversation. So the second miracle is that he has to turn to pure water, I mean the dirty water into pure water. The third miracle is then Jesus has to turn to pure water into pure wine. Now, this is happening in an instant. 
because he's demonstrating power. Now, when he turns this into pure wine, before the guy's eyes, they see the coloration of the liquid change. Whoa. The fourth miracle is that when we read the story, we forget how long is the celebration. How long was this, is the celebration? How long? One week. These six water pots, only these six from this moment on, will be the source of the wine for the city of Cana for the remainder of the celebration. And as long, oh, and here's the key here. As long as you remember the joy of your salvation, the words you speak will be rivers of living water that will be coming out of your stone body. And when it comes out, it will be intoxicating like alcohol to those who hear. That's what Jesus said. Out of the innermost parts of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And when people hear you, and if you're in my glory, they will think they've been intoxicated by the Spirit. Praise God. I want that. But the moment you forget the joy of your salvation, and you start holding on to the, the rights of your religion, the wine dries up, the water turns bitter, and the pot gets dirty. That's why it's important for you to tell your testimony to your friends. That's why it's important for you to talk about the, the, what God's doing in our church. Because every time you do that, you keep letting the rivers of water become joy to people who hear it. That's why the vision is important. The vision that pastor's casting, what we're doing and what you're doing in your leadership team, that is all important because what happens is that you keep letting, you're letting the river flow. The fifth thing is that the miracle had nothing to do with the water pot and the wines. It has nothing to do. That is the, that's the resource he's going to use. But that's not the real miracle. See, what I haven't told you is that on this day that Jesus is in Cana, he's in the wrong city. Jesus is from where? Nazareth. He's not supposed to be there. He's there at the wrong time for the, for, for the wrong reason. He's not there to be lifted up. He's there to serve his mom. Some of you will get that on the way home. Jesus is serving his mother to produce the first miracle. And... There are only six disciples that are called at the marriage of Cana. Jesus doesn't have all 12 of them. He only has six. Six of the disciples will only know this story because of what the disciples, the other six, tell them. They were, they were not there to see it with their eyes. They're going to have to trust the story of the six that were, and they're going to have to believe the story of the six that were so they can become part of the story of 12. And as this church continues to grow, there will be people that will not know the stories that you know, and you're going to have to share those stories so they can be the stories of the increase. And Jesus is saying, if I can use six water pots and I can bring wine out of that stone jar... What can I do out of the six of you if you give your life to me? Miracle number six is that the six disciples trusted in Jesus. When they saw this happen, they trusted him. They gave him their love. They gave him their trust. They said, we trust your ideas. We trust your opinion. We trust your evidences. We trust your path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do what? Lean not unto your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all the ways, and He will direct your path. 
And that's what the disciples were saying. From that miracle, wherever you go, we going with you, man. We want to see what's next. And then the seventh miracle, and the biggest miracle of all, is in that scripture. He revealed his glory. Everybody say glory. Now, if you're taking down notes, and I've got to hurry... There are four levels of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your church. The Holy Spirit will move through four roadmaps, through four dimensions. Dimension number one of the anointing of the Holy Spirit is what we call the anointing of the heart. Okay? Everybody say heart. Have you ever been in the grocery store, walking down the cereal aisle? And someone you don't know walks by and you start talking and the next thing you know you're talking about Jesus. Have you ever at the coffee shop you end up sharing something about Christ? Have you ever done that? Anybody ever done that? Raise your hand if you've done that. That's the first level of the anointing. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. That is what we call the anointing of the heart. So when me and someone else are talking sometimes on an airplane. I'm talking to someone, and all of a sudden I realize they're a believer, and we start talking about things of God, and I just sense the presence of God in, that, in those seats. I'm walking in the first level of the anointing or the ministry of the Holy Spirit that flows through me, not to me. Second level of the anointing is called the anointing of the mind. That is where, have you ever been somewhere, heard a sermon, heard something, and you go, I didn't know any of that. I've read that scripture a hundred times and never seen that. Whoa. What's happening is God is giving you supernatural knowledge. Because people are destroyed because of a lack of... So the Holy Spirit at times wants to give you knowledge. There's Sundays where pastor preaches and you walk out and go... Wow, that was awesome. You know, the greatest thing you can do to make the glory move in the church is every time pastor preaches something that is so unbelievable or ministers to you, text him, email him, call him and say, Pastor, you ministered to me today. It was, when people did that to me, it makes me continue to dig deeper. Because the, the power of appreciation and affirmation is a strong tool in a church of vision. No gratitude. Bad attitude. The next thing that happens is level number three. The glory of the Lord. Uh, Go back to verse 11, please. The glory of the Lord. Now, the glory of the Lord is the third dimension of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The glory of the Lord is what's manifested on the flesh of man. The glory is why you lift your hands. The glory is why you sing. The glory is why you clap. The glory is why you respond. It's because your flesh. And your flesh is a slave to two things. Your heart and your mind. So if I look in the congregation when I pastored and my people weren't worshiping the Lord, I knew one of two things was going on in their head. Number one, they had sin in their heart. Number two... They did not want to receive the knowledge of the word to worship accordingly. But if, I'm, if I don't have sin in my heart, and I love the Lord with all my heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, when, when we're singing, I'm singing and I'm lifting my hands. And I'm, because God, God inhabits the praises of his people. So when we come to church, now get this, when we come to church, Mike, And we come in here and say, today, I pray for the glory to fill this house. Do that next Sunday. When you're driving to church, say, Lord, today, let the glory fill the house. Just let your your power, let your miracle miracle working power of the glory of the anointing fill this house so you can move through us, so, God, you can be demonstrated and magnified in our community. Do that. I used to tell my church, do that every Sunday. And if nothing happens, walk out the door and say, devil, you're a liar. I made a deposit today. I'm coming back next week. I'm going to make another deposit. And one day, the glory is going to hit this house. And then the fourth level of the anointing is called the awakening. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, all men would be drawn unto me, right? 
Well, here's how all men are drawn to you. Is if you demonstrate the glory of the Lord, service after service after service, day after day after day. Because the water plots ran for the length of the wedding. If you let God bring his glory through you every day, there will be a Sunday where the awakening will hit this church. And when it does, you better hold back. It, it, it's, it's going to be unbelievable. And I sense it here. It remind, this reminds me a lot of the third church I pastored, where our people were ready. They just didn't know where to go. They didn't know how to get there. They didn't know they wanted to go there. And we just started saying, look, guys, if we're going to go where, we, where you believe, and I believe God wants us to go, our key is we've got to let the glory be resonant in our services, every service. Because when the glory is manifested, the awakening occurs. So we worship. We celebrate. We pray. We share our faith during the week. We talk about what God is doing through us, not to us. We talk about the anticipation. Pastor, I can't wait to hear what you're going to say next week. I used to, I would have people, we had email, we didn't have text. And I would get emails on Tuesday. Pastor, I don't know what's going to happen Sunday, but I'm so excited. I wish today was Sunday. Man, I would get so juiced up. It started with just three or four at the, at, within a year. I'm getting 100 of those a week. People are in one accord, and they're in the one accord of the glory of the Lord. And the miracles move. And Jesus moves instantly in his power. And the Father is moving progressively. For his timing. And we're seeing miracles move on both sides of the fence. And people are excited. It's hard to believe that this, the first miracle Jesus does, he does it in the wrong city. Serving his mother, and he doesn't have the whole posse with him. But here's the word I have for you today. I have a word from the Lord for you. The people are in this room today. You are the people that God wants to flow his glory through. He wants you to know and acknowledge that today is a day of destiny for this church. He wants you to understand that if you will trust him and put your faith in him and worship him in all of his righteousness and hold back, don't hold back, but worship in spirit and in truth, miracles will begin to happen instantaneously for people to see the power of Christ that's still alive today. And miracles will happen in time so people will understand that the truth will set you free. You didn't come here for the toy. You came here for the relationship. And... Over the next period of a year, you will see supernatural things happen here. And what you cannot do is say, that's not the way I believe God would move. If God can speak through a donkey and pour wine out of a, out of a rock, what can he do through us? So we trust we trust in the Lord. We put our faith in the principles of our church through Christ Jesus, through the Word. We serve the, jo the Lord with joy and gladness because the joy of the Lord is our strength. We come anticipating every week that this is the week that the glory hits this building. And when it does, people will cry, they will weep, they, will, they won't want to go home, people will want to be touched, people will, people will just start saying, I drove by and I wanted to come in here. You know why? The glory is here, and the Holy Spirit is drawing people into His glory. You're going to preach with a new anointing. You're going to see the Scripture in a new way. Open your mind to receive. Open your heart to hear. Don't allow the things of the, of the present, the urgent, to, dim, to distract you from what God says is important. And the importance is, is that you are going to be the keeper of the glory. 
The Holy Spirit is the dispenser. You are the keeper. Every week you come to church and you put the lid on it, it's not going to happen. Every week you walk in here and say, today, I'd love to see the glory come down. Where, where's our worship leader? Every week, you've got to come in here and say, this is the, this is the day the Lord has made. We're going to not only rejoice in it, we're going to walk in it. We're going to walk in his glory. Because the day we as a congregation, I, I feel what I felt the day it all connected. I was preaching and in the middle of it, Paul, I just stopped. And I stood there and everybody was looking at me. They thought I was having a stroke. And God said, do you trust me? I said, yes, Lord. He said, well, then feed them. Teach them. Give them truth. Dig deep. Don't be distracted. And if you do that, next week, I'll open the windows of heaven. And I sense that, right? I mean, it's all over. I can just, I can just sense it physically all over me. You guys are so close to the awakening you ought to be able to smell it and taste it. You're so close to what God wants to do to bring your family members in. You're so close to where you're going to be able to see people walk through the streets and come in here and be radically delivered in a moment's notice. You're, you're so close. You're so close. You're so close to seeing people who you may work at Walmart on Monday through Friday, but on Sunday you're a mighty man of God in this building. You're a mighty woman of God. You might be working at the plant. You may be working at a hotel. You might be working at a restaurant. That's just where God has placed you so His glory can flow through you because you are a mighty man and woman of God. And He's placed you strategically all through this city. He's placed you strategically all through the city because when he flips the switch and you allow the switch to be flipped, people from all points of light, all points of the city, all, do, all dimensions are going to look at you. You're going to walk into the doctor's office and the doctor's going to say, what's different with you? And you're going to say, I don't know if you can handle what I'm about to say to you. I've been changed. Oh, I'm not... My body's going to die and decay. and Yeah, you're the doctor who's going to help me. But I'm telling you this. I believe Jesus is going to heal me or the Father is going to use me to be healed. But here's the deal. About three weeks ago, Doc, the glory of the Lord hit me. Not salvation. His glory was revealed to me. I saw him in his countenance. I saw him in his brilliance. I saw him in his majestic place. And it's a place I want to go to every day. It's a place I want to go to every day. And I would go home at night and the phone would ring. And it'd be a little 24-year-old girl who'd been saved four months. She goes, Pastor, please forgive me for calling you, but i got to just tell you this. Oh, it's okay, Lindsay. Tell me what you got. Pastor, I... I went to work today and and I felt it. I love the way they say it. I felt it. I felt it. Just like we do when we worship, I felt it. And I said, Lindsay, what did you do? She said, Pastor, I think I sinned. I said, what did you do? She said, Pastor, I, I went to the storage room and I threw up my hands. And I began to pray in the spirit. And I, I don't was I supposed to pray out there on the out there in the floor where everybody could see me? I said, Oh sweetie, God took you to your quiet place. For where, where you were today, that is now going to be your quiet place. She said, But yeah, but Pastor, when I came out of there, someone asked me when I came through the door, what's wrong with you? And I just looked at him, I said, I'll tell you what's wrong with me. I just had a I just had some time with Jesus in the storage room. She said, and my friend looked at me. She said, can I have that same Jesus? She said, I led him to the Lord in the baby department of J.C. Penney's. Am I supposed to be doing stuff like that? I said, oh, sweetie, you, you're supposed to do that and so much more. Or for a little Puerto Rican girl to come to church one Sunday morning. She had heard about us. The church was just booming. She came to church. She's a little Catholic girl. 
at the end of the service, she walks up to me. She says, I want the power of God like you have, like everybody in this building has. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, all these people, power of God touches them. She said, something happens and they, they, they fall out on the floor and, 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 and they talk in an unknown language. And I just had a dream and God told me that's what he wants me to do. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. I said, well, let me pray for you. She said, oh, no, don't pray for me yet. Don't pray for me yet. And I said, well, I'm sorry. She said, and she, she, she got down and laid in the floor. I said, well, what are you doing down there? She said, I'm going to end up down here anyhow. I might as well get down here now. See, that's what you're looking for. People will hungry for the glory. And if you want the glory of the Lord at 1137, if you want to be an instrument where God's going to flow through you, it's the wrong Sunday. It's the wrong person. You just came to church today. You weren't expecting all this. But God said, guess what? You may not have been expecting it. Like that, that bride and groom and those families, they weren't expecting wine to come out of six rocks when they planned this party. But if you're here and you say, I want to be part of the glory of the Lord. I want God's glory to flow through me. I want you to stand at your feet. And say, I want to be part of this, this glorious revolution that's about to happen to our church. I want to be part of it. I want to come to church walking in the glory. I don't want to get here and try to get filled up. I want to get here and pour out. Let me say it again. I don't want to come here and get filled up. I want to come here and pour it out. And let people see it. Let people manifest it. Let people sense it. Now, I want to ask you, really, are you serious? Because that Sunday I was in this altar and I just stopped while I was preaching. I walked up on the platform. I said, God, this is the Sunday. It's going to rain on us. And people looked at me like I was crazy. I got real calm. And I said, guys, this is the Sunday. The promise has come. I'm going to ask you to come back next Sunday and be prepared before you walk in the door so when the music starts, God inhabits the praises of His people, we praise. During the prayer time, we pray. During the preaching, we learn. And during the altar, we watch God do miracles. If you're for that, I looked at him, I said, if you're for that, just turn to someone and say, that's exactly what I'm looking for do that right now that's exactly what I'm looking for lift your hands if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord this is the Sunday you want to get saved because this is a destiny moment where God is going to do something destined in your life so if you don't know Jesus, just say, Father, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. Jesus, I for, forgive me of my sins. I, I, your blood redeems me. I confess you by my mouth, and I'm saved. Raise your hands. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Father God, in the name above all names, and by the authority that was given to your Son, that was demonstrated and poured onto us, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is the vehicle of glory, I now release the glory of the Lord into this house. Every vessel that has their hand up, whether it's stone or clay, make it pliable in your hands. Whether they're young or old, nine years old or 90, may you pour your spirit out on their life. May they begin to have dreams in their bed at night. May you speak to them in visions at school. May you tell them hope at work. May you let them know at the doctor's office you're still in control. And that your miracles still flow through them. And your glory will be revealed. Make these friends elements and vessels of your glory. Not to contain it, but to distribute it. May their homes be blessed. May their children to the fourth generation be blessed. May they receive the abundance of what you've promised them in your word and by your spirit. May us have a courage of of 
fearlessness. And may we rebuke all fear in our life. May the power of boldness come upon our friends that they will speak according to your word and according to your spirit that you will use them as mighty vessels of glory. May you minister to their finances and may you give them the blessings that they are asking for so they can see your hand at work and may they give back to you. I ask you, Lord, that you would continue to bring the abundance of your glory into this house. Week after week, service after service, leaders meetings after leaders meeting, children's church, May kids get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost in children's church. May your power fall in the youth department. Will, will teenagers get healed? Lord, I pray for the day someone walks out of a wheelchair. I pray for the day that someone is healed of cancer. No weapon formed against this congregation of glory shall prosper. And every tongue that rises itself up against the glory of the Lord in this house shall be condemned. And now I pray for Pastor Paul and I pray for Pastor Mary. And I ask you now that you would give them revelation. That you would give them revelation of spirit. That you would give them revelation of the word. That you would give them revelation of the glory. That you would begin to open, pull back the curtains and let him see from perspective. Let him see from the power of scope. Let him see through your eyes, oh God. Let him understand the moves and the, and the way the spirit moves. Let him see how the word will be demonstrated through him. May he speak words that will give us hope. May His words give us strength to build. May His words bring people from believership to discipleship and from discipleship to leadership. May His word, coming from you and her word, be a word that will revolutionize this city and beyond. In Jesus' name, the church says...